Hey, what's up, genderqueer gang? This is Quinn, and uh, this is our open topic week. So I thought I would take some time and discuss um, kind of a slightly philosophical view on dysphoria. Um, I've been reading this book, which is Sartre for beginners. Uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, he wrote Being and Nothingness. Um, he's... Um, He's, I guess, an existentialist, um, and I just wanted to read you a few excerpts from this book, uh, because it, it totally relates to the problems I've been having with, uh, general gender dysphoria, like, if I go to the gym and there's too many, like, people in there, or especially really, like, muscly dudes, um, I feel really dysphoric and I can't be in there long. So I think this kind of explains it. So bear with me through the reading. I'll try to, you know, not make it too long. Um, so in this reference, uh, to serve my example, the book says the other, and that is referring to the other people, not yourself. So uh, the appearance of the other forces you to reinterpret your world uh, before seeing him or her, the grass, the paths, the benches were there for me. Now they are there for him or her. It's like that sudden reinterpretation that takes place when first you see the figure in a psychology text as a duck, and then all at once it's a rabbit. Um, it's because the other's freedom destabilizes mine. I objectify him or her, but I cannot fully objectify her, and when I say objectify, I don't mean view as an object like, you know, how chauvinistic people view women, say, as an object. Um, just objectifying her, like looking at that person in an objective way as an object in your reality. Um, so it is because the other's freedom destabilizes your own. Uh, you objectify her but you cannot fully objectify her because you know that her gaze at yourself objectifies you and turns you, as it were, into stone, into a thing. Uh, to see the other is to understand the permanent possibility of being seen by the other. And one would experience the actuality of this possibility as shame. Uh, remember the time you were talking to yourself when you thought you were alone and suddenly you discovered that someone else was observing you? Uh, what did you feel at that moment of your discovery? Were you picking your nose? Were you, you know, any any of those random things where you wish people didn't see you? Um, so what was the feeling at the moment of discovery? It was shame, most likely. Maybe you faked it, pretending you were actually humming a tune, and you left, acting as casual as you could, without meeting the gaze of the other. Um, so... In shame, we discover an aspect of our being which we would not have known otherwise. We discover ourselves as the object that is created by the other's gaze. We discover what Sartre calls our being for others. We are forced to pass judgment on ourselves as an object. So, to summarize, basically, uh, when an other sees you, someone that's not yourself, um, it makes you aware of yourself more so than were you just by yourself. I mean, there is awareness like of your own mind and then there's awareness of being seen through other people's eyes because you know people are looking at you. And I just thought that those passages really kind of talked a lot about uh, how I interpret my dysphoria and how it makes me feel. Um, you know, I don't always have a lot of social dysphoria, but sometimes I do, you know, it comes in, uh, waves, and, <clears throat> excuse me, and I just thought that Sartre had a really interesting point, and I kind of, you know, took it to mint, or took it, let me see if I can talk, I applied it to my situation, so it makes sense for me, just wanted to share that with you guys, um, and, you know, basically, I was saying, for instance, the gym, when I'm at the gym and, you know, I, 
other people are there. I feel overwhelmed. I feel dysphoric. I feel like, oh, what are they thinking about me? You know, is that guy looking at me? Is he wondering what gender I am? Uh, am I passing? Like, you know, all the things in your head that you think. Um, and I just think that that's really great that, you know, in the heart of existential philosophy, there's something that could, that I could kind of relate to. Um, and I really think that your awareness, when you know you're being watched by someone else, or, you know, recording this YouTube video, you're more aware of what you're saying because you know it's going to be listened to. And you, you're already anticipating, sort of, what other people will think. So, uh, I think, just on a tangent note, that that's part of the reason why um, sometimes I'm not just letting it all out there, you know, sometimes on videos I don't bear my soul, because, you know, I guess for fear of bearing my soul to all the millions of people on YouTube, uh, but I just thought it was just fascinating that, you know, there's actually, um, terms for that kind of thing, and that, you know, awareness from other people's eyes is a lot different if you know they're watching you, or even if you're just aware that someone's in the room. Um, he gives this description, oh, I think I read it, about uh, looking through the keyhole. Yeah, um, and then, you know, someone walks up behind you and you're like, oh my god, they know, you know, what I'm doing, they caught me. So immediately you start looking at yourself through their eyes because that awareness has dawned on you that you are being watched by someone else. Um, sorry, this has run on so long. I'm probably babbling about it, but I just thought it was really interesting. Um, and another thing I wanted to mention, uh, Saturday morning I woke up and uh, had a couple triggers for my chest dysphoria, and I got pretty upset and decided to uh, go back to bed, and, uh, there were some tears shed, and I think that, uh, you know, transgender people or gender variant people that have body dysphoria, um, you know, it's a hard thing to go through, but that night I went and saw, uh, Lara Jane Grace from or Laura, yeah, I said that right, Laura Jane Grace, from Against Me in concert. It was her uh, debut solo performance, and if you don't know, she's a trans woman who transitioned on stage. She was pretty famous before she transitioned, and now I feel like she's even more famous, and she's just one of my idols, and it made me really happy to see her, you know, getting up there and... um I don't know too much about vocal cord surgery or anything, but, you know, she hasn't had anything done to her voice, so I just think it's very brave to get up there and lay your soul out through song and still sound like a male kind of voice. I don't know if that's offensive to say, but, um, yeah, it just gave me hope, you know. If she can do that and be brave and ballsy, then shit, I can wake up every day smiling until I get top surgery. Um, yeah, it just gave me hope. So, uh, that's basically all I wanted to say to you guys. Um, but yeah, if you would like a good read, pick up Sart for Beginners by Donald Palmer. Um, yes, this lesson was brought to you by the letter S for Sart <laughs> and the letter T for Transgender. <laughs> Alright guys, I've rambled on long enough. I'll catch you next Tuesday. Take care.